My name is Kit Needham. I'm Associate Director for the Carnegie Mellon Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And in that capacity, for the past seven years, I've been working with over hundreds of students who have startup ideas. And one of the questions that comes up all the time is, how do I know if my idea is a good one? So what I'm going to do today is walk you through the process that I walk through new startups or students who have new ideas. And after that, I'm going to spend more time going through a specific example to show you how it works. So the very first thing I would say, if how do you know if your idea is a good one? You ask your customer. Because ultimately, they're the ones that are going to know whether this is something that is of value that they would actually like to buy. But there's a right way and there's a wrong way. The wrong way is what I call death by demo, where, hi, here, go through this, tell me what you think, or I'm going to tell you all about my neat technology and this new business I want to start up, what do you think? Or even worse, how would you solve the problem? And there's an old Henry Ford quote that says that if I had asked people how they wanted me to solve their problem, they would have said, faster horses. So, but the right way is called customer discovery. And this is the first phase in the whole, all, in three customer segments. And this is the phase that just about everybody either skips over, or even if they do it, they do it wrong. They immediately go into what we just saw was customer validation, getting them to support or tell you whether they thought your idea was a good one. So this is one of the most important phases, and I can't stress to you enough how important it is to do this. So what is customer discovery? It's really clarifying what is the pain or problem you're trying to solve. Being real clear about focus on who's having the pain or problem, and lastly, how the who are currently dealing with it. The reason is, right now, for your startup idea, it's an hypothesis. You believe that you can create a product or service that's going to solve a various problem for a population, but we really don't know. We really need to go out and test us. We need to go out and talk to the people that you're going to be targeting. So the right way is get out of the building. And this is coming from Steve Blank, who is one of the famous people that everybody in entrepreneurship knows. The best way is face-to-face -face interviews. That way you can see people's expression, you can follow up on their comments. Skype works, telephone works, shadowing, where you may actually go into the workplace and follow somebody around to see what they're doing and how they're currently handling matters also works. What does not work is online surveys. So you either send it out to people you know who may fill it out, or you send it out to others. And let me ask you, how many random surveys do you get from total strangers that you fill out? So it just does not get you the data that you need, nor is it reliable. And I don't know about you, but every time I try to fill out, trying to help somebody and fill out a survey, there's inevitably something that's none of the above, and there's no place to qualify or quantify what I'm, how I would answer that question. So what are you going to ask about when you're doing this customer exploration? What is the pain or problem? How bad is it? Have you ever gone into a doctor's office and you say, I've got a pain? The doctor will ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, can you tell me how bad the pain is? So they know if you say 3, that it's not severe. But if you say 9, then that's an entirely different category. So you want to find out how bad the pain or problem is from the clients. How often are they experiencing? Once a day, once a week, once a month, once a year, once every five years? It makes a difference. How are they solving it now? They're doing something, even if it's doing nothing. Uh, but that makes a difference because it's a choice. Uh, that is, in essence, sometimes doing nothing is a competitive solution. And then you want to find out how well is that solution working for them. So how do you do this? 15 minutes, five questions. Why 15 minutes? Usually when you find, when you talk to people, that everybody will give you 15 minutes. Uh, they won't give you an hour. Um, but that's an easy time frame that they can say yes to. And on a practical matter, five questions is about as many as you can get through in that 15 minutes. So the first thing you need to do is prep five questions and then five backup questions in case the person will talk with you later. They should be measurable, and, but you should also have some that are qualitative. And the way to do this is get some friends around or maybe your other teammates and get a whiteboard in front of you and think of every possible question you want to know about this customer. And you just throw it up on the board. No editing, no trying to perfect the questions at that point. And what you'll find then is they begin to cluster 
And then ultimately you begin to refine and then you begin to prioritize. And so this is the good way to come up with those five questions and then maybe some backup questions. Because what you will find is that when you talk to the people and they get excited about what you're, what you're doing, they are very excited about you solving a potential problem that they have, that they will then give you 15 more minutes. They will uh, uh, and answer many more questions. I did this myself as part of an NSFI core team, and I found that I got some people on the phone that an hour later, and we still weren't done. Some people said, I have 15 minutes, but uh, can we schedule another time because I really want to talk about this. This is really important to me. That's when you know that you've really hit upon something, a pain or a problem that is very important to people if you can solve it. So you want to plan who you want to interview. So your customers, there are a lot of what I call stakeholders. And I'll give you more examples of this when I go through the example. So there are the people who buy and make decisions. You can have the users. You can have influencers. So for example, if you were going to be creating a children's toy, the users would be the children, but the buyers and the decision makers are the parents. So you need to figure out, you need to include in your in your questions that you ask, uh, you have to include both, both of those type of stakeholders or, um, for the product. So figure out where you're going to find them. So let's just say you've come up with a really unique stove that is compact that could be used by campers that uses a special type of energy source. So if you wanted to go talk to uh, people who camp, I would go hang out in front of an REI store or L.L. Bean. Um, I would find places where they, they congregate, they have meetups. Um, try to find them when they're concentrated. Uh, conventions and conferences is a wonderful place where you'll find uh, all these types of people that you need to talk to. Then you want to practice this with friends. These questions should just sort of flow. They should feel comfortable, and you get to refine them based upon the feedback. So get started. So what you do is you approach the people and say, hi, I'm doing some research on X. Uh, do you have 15 minutes to answer a few questions? You do not talk about your idea. Because if you talk about your idea, other than saying this is the field, uh, you'll end up tainting or steering the results. You may need to say this is not a sales call. And for you students, student card works well. Uh, I would wear your CMU t-shirts or sweatshirts um, because everybody seems to want to help students and uh, they're very receptive to that. Very important, go after people you don't know um, because your friends will either pull the punches or they know where your head is and so they, they tend to refine some of their answers. For business to business, your C level is not always the best. Um, by this, I mean you don't necessarily need to talk to the CEO, the chief technology officer, the CFO, or any of those folks. You're often better going and talking to the program managers, maybe the salespeople. You don't have to just talk to the head. So some other good closing questions sometimes is who else should I talk to? Um, that if people uh, can give you ideas of different types of people or, or specific individuals you should talk to. This is particularly important if you're in a business because perhaps you're talking to the head of somebody who's in the technology section but says, oh yeah, but you need to go talk to the CFO because they're the ones who make the buying decision. And then occasionally it helps to ask, what else should I have asked? You're so focused on what it is you're, you're trying to learn that sometimes they're what I call outliers or new thoughts that you hadn't really thought about before, but they're adding and enriching uh, the type of research you should be doing. And again, I'll give an, ex uh, an example of this in a minute. So here's the big question. So everybody's watching this. I want you to take five seconds and either write down how many you think you should be doing or at least come up with a mental number in your head. Over 100 stakeholders. And I know you're going, wow. But think of this. You're going to be creating a brand new business. You're going to be spending a lot of time and money on this at some point. And isn't it far better to really, really understand what your customers are thinking, what they want, before you really get started investing in actually creating the product? And statistically, an N of 20, an N of 30, that's not really valid. 
minimum 100. And I have worked with a number of teams, I've seen them, and the ones who stop short of that, 60, 70, they think they're there. The ones who cross over into the 100, there's something magical about that, that all of a sudden they figure it out. Uh, it, it's, they, they get very focused and they really do know what, what they're doing. So while you're doing this, keep notes. Um, stop and assess periodically. You may need to change your questions, um, your little bit of approach. Uh, as you're getting more and more feedback, you may need to include a different set of stakeholders in your research. So why are you doing all this other than the fact that you're learning about your business? This avoids unnecessary pivots. And pivots is the term when you start out doing one thing and then somewhere along the way you realize that the customers don't want that product. Um, maybe they want it, but they won't pay for it. Uh, there is something that is missing. And I can't tell you, every time I see a company that is doing a pivot, I am pretty sure it's because they just started building the the business without really doing the necessary research. Secondly, you get first-hand knowledge of your target audience. This is who you're selling to, and you know them backwards and forwards now. You really know where their head is. Also, when you're talking to these people, you can observe the degree of enthusiasm and interest, that if they're leaning forward, you can see the fire in their eyes, as opposed to, yeah, no, that's a good idea. Um, no, that's, um, yeah, it's a problem, but yeah, I get by. That really tells you something. As they're talking to you and they're talking about the problems, they're giving you the exact words you're going to turn around and sell back to them. This overcomes your problem with X, Y, and Z. And the customers then feel like, oh, they really understand my problem that I'm having. It helps you prioritize what is most important. And lastly, investors, if you're going to go after investment, they will ask you how many of your, your stakeholders you've talked to. And if you said 20 or 30, they won't pay any attention. They know really successful entrepreneurs have interviewed or really understand, and that's over that 100 mark. So after you do all this, you get this back. Ask yourself, is it a really big problem? And is it a really big market? So it could be a great big problem, and it could be a nice product. But if there are only 100 people that really, really, really want it, then that's not going to be an effective business. But that's another discussion on how we do that. So I'm going to give you an example. Hylion uh, has, it's a startup here with some CMU students that have developed a hybrid system. Think of Prius for tractor trailers. Other hybrid systems all target the cabs of these 18 wheelers. This is something that goes onto the back end onto the trailer itself. It uses regenerative braking to capture power, that their hypothesis is that it can be reused to accelerate, therefore reducing fuel consumption. Based upon their laboratory uh, testing on this, that it reduces fuel consumption by over 30% with an ROI after you buy this of less than one year, which that's a very strong proposition to make to the customers. But they had to go out and validate this hypothesis over their proposal. So the sample questions, I don't have the actual ones they use, but you, when talking, um, asking how much on average do you spend on fuel? What percent of your annual budget is that? Um, have you done analysis on fuel usage? What do you know about your patterns? Um, what are you currently doing now to reduce your fuel costs? Um, my favorite questions are, uh, is the, that I call the scale one. On a scale of one to 10, how well are these techniques working? And then, no matter what number they give you, you're going to ask them, why did you give each that number? The reason is that if they're giving it their current solution a 9, you know minimally that's the bar. You have to reach, if not exceed. And if they give it a 3, and they tell you then why they gave it a 3, they're telling you all the features and all the problems they have with the competition that you know that you want to include into your product. Very effective tool for getting a product definition. So who did Hylian interview? Well, first of all, they went out to fleet managers. These are the ones that have trucks that they carry target uh, cargo um, for, for other customers. They talked to the truck drivers. They went out to independent truck drivers that did not drive for fleets. People who make the trailers, mechanics that service the fleet, companies with proprietary fleets, industry association staff, which are a really rich source of information. 
every trade seems to have a have a uh, an association. Where do they find them? Um, they're most successfully they found going to industry conventions. They went to two in different parts of the country where they found just about every stakeholder that they needed. Um, they spent a lot of time at truck stops talking to the drivers themselves. Uh, they went to a couple fleet owners' headquarters and not only interviewed the management there, but they also talked to the service people, um, some of the drivers, sales offices where they sell the trailers. And frankly, they did a fair number of these by telephone. What they found, six million trailers in the U.S. Each trailer averages 6.5 miles per gallon. You can read this. It's $85,000 per year per trailer. Big problem. That adds up to 52 billion gallons of fuel consumed each year. And on top of that, if you think of it, that also includes um, all the exhaust fumes, uh, which is obviously people want to reduce. So when they did, did their calculations, they can save this industry $46 billion in fuel. And at a sale price of $25,000, they were able to validate that at some point about what they'd be willing to spend, that this is a big market for them, $150, $150 billion potential if everybody buys. But they also found out a number of things. They eliminated the independent drivers, or they eliminated the ones who spent time just driving around the city making deliveries. This is for the long-haul fleets that go coast to coast. They also found out 15% of the fuel is used to run the cab at night. Truck drivers sleep in their, in their cabs, and they have to keep the motors running to, for their heater, air conditioning, their other electronics. But they also found out when talking to the drivers that this causes the cab to shake, and they get really poor sleep. And you think about somebody driving around these multi-ton machines, which um, when they're half, half asleep, um, it can lead to accidents. And this ended up being a very compelling, this is what I call the outlier. This was ended up being a very compelling, uh, ultimately a sales pitch um, that resonated with the management. Uh, and the drivers supported it. These are the stakeholders, the influencers, uh, that said this would be really great if, if we could use this to run our cab at night. So in conclusion, for Hylian, they found out that it was a really big problem. It was a really big market. They had a great product. And they, therefore, this all adds up to a great business. They went on later to a, compete in Department of Energy uh, national competition, which they won first place. Um, they also found that there are a number of customers that are willing to test the product. But they did this by going through this methodology that is standard and will work for every business. And frankly, in some cases, you're going to find out that it's not the biggest problem. Um, it's not the necessarily the greatest product. And isn't it good to know that before you spend a lot of time so that you can move on? I hope you get really serious about customer discovery and do it right. Thank you very much. Thank you.